I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're finishing up my series ranking every Elden Ring boss via their region. Last on the list for the base game, we have Lanedell, the Royal Capital. Whether it's the first visit, or the return at the end of the game, there are a ton of unique bosses to fight. Interested in previous episodes of this series? Check the description for more information, and if you want to see my Shadow of the Erdtree boss ranking, it will be coming soon. Bosses only need an official boss health bar to appear on this list, so let's jump right in. All 15 Lanedell Royal Capital bosses ranked. Let me know your favorites down below. At number 15, we have the Deathbird found in the capital outskirts. The hardest of the Deathbird fights from a statistical perspective, you tackle this winged beast inside a graveyard near a merchant shack, and honestly, it's just a case of this boss type being severely outclassed this late in the game that has it at the bottom of today's list. I fought two Deathbirds in Limgrave, one in Leonia that challenged me to a surprising degree, but this capital outskirts Deathbird appears right on the cusp of my character outgrowing their fight. Just look at the damage I was doing. The sky is over 8,000 HP, and I still folded him up like a piece of cardboard. I like the Deathbirds, but at this point I wanted something more exciting, and all the other bosses here in Lane Dell just scratch more of an itch. He drops the Twin Bird Kite Shield upon defeat, which when at 20% HP or less, grants the player a 5% plus to their attack power, and a negative 10% negation to their damage, effects that stack with the red and blue feathered branch sword talismans obtained from prior Deathbird fights. I do love a boss series where all the rewards actually synergize together. At number 14, we have the Grave Warden Duelist found inside Ariza's side tomb. I've said it throughout this series, but any time I get the chance to fight a duelist, I don't complain. I think they have fun movesets, their designs are really cool, and their weapons are sick as heck. This duelist, though, is pretty forgettable, because it has the misfortune of being the side piece in its own area. I mean, it's in the side tomb for god's sake. Most people will wander to Ariza Hero's grave just a few steps down the road and completely miss this sneaky catacomb. They do try to make this fight a bit tougher by placing small warrior jars in the boss room, but of all the enemies to try and make a fight harder, they pick the ones that are easiest to outrun and easiest to smash into little pieces. I get it, the catacomb was themed around those enemy types, but it doesn't really work. I died once to this boss because I was being stubborn and refusing to use my shield. I since learned my mistake, but I don't consider the death due to difficulty, more just me messing around. Defeating this boss gets you the Soul Jars of Fortune Ashes. This entire mini dungeon as said revolved around the living jars, so this ash makes complete sense. I just wish they could actually do something in a fight. They're too slow, low HP, not really worth the effort. The least memorable of the Grave Warden duelists, methinks. At number 13, we have the Onyx Lord found in the capital outskirts Sealed Tunnel. A nice step up from our previous two entries, I really enjoyed this brief skirmish, because unlike the Onyx Lord we fought in the Everjail near Caria Manor, here the boss immediately starts with his best moves. Meteorite is summoned from the very start, and combined with the boss's repelling gravity magic that attempts to keep the tarnished at a distance, you can be overwhelmed if you're not careful. The trick is that it won't use Meteorite if you're too close, instead choosing to melee or repel you. So your goal should be to consistently be in the Onyx Lord's face so you can control the moves it uses. Though even if Meteorite is summoned, it's not hard to avoid. I like how proactive and aggressive this boss is overall, way more than the Everjail variant, and a solid challenge to boot. Defeating him grants you the Onyx Lord's Greatsword, which is a very fun weapon skill, Onyx Lord's Repulsion. Using this creates an AoE around you that, when released, will repel any enemies within range. It's fucking funny. This boss also guards the Divine Tower of West Altus, where if you've defeated Rykard, you can ascend to activate his Great Rune. That little extra detail is what pushes this boss ahead of my bottom two. 
At number 12, we have the Fell Twins found on the bridge leading to the Divine Tower of East Altus. Gotta be honest when I say that the introduction to this boss in the overall arena is what does the heavy lifting here. I love the sudden ambush and the darkened abyss you face them in, it's so reminiscent of the Four Kings, and it's a simple aesthetic I really adore. They're clearly meant to be symbolic of Morgoth and Moog, the Fell Twins whose great runes are both activated at the Divine Tower they're guarding. In fact, the Axe Wielder coats their blade in blood like Moog, while the Cleaver Wielder uses holy magic like Morgoth. There are parallels here. I don't fully understand why the arena gets so dark, I'm guessing it's just illusion magic, but I wish there was an item description or something that spelled it out a little more. The fight itself is pretty standard, one omen will approach while the other stays behind, so it's more like two 1v1s you have to go through instead. The downside is that if you've recently been to the subterranean shunning grounds, which you likely have if you just came from Landell, you fought omen after omen after omen, to the point where these enemies are just a bit annoying? And that is, at least for me, the case with the Fell Twins. Defeating them grants you Omen Killer Rolo, a spirit summon who is naturally very strong, can proc bleed on most bosses, and has a wide moveset of cleaver swings to cut down all that stand before him. Well worth the effort. The Fell Twins are a fun diversion, if a bit of a jump scare, but their nature as omens makes them feel repetitive. At number 11, we have Eska, Priest of Blood, found in the Landell Catacombs. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Eska. On the one hand, I adore his design. The pyramid head cowl that covers his face is absolutely fierce, slay the house down, mother boots, kitty kitty purr. I actually enjoy his bleed-based moveset with the Reduvia and the various blood incantations. They keep me on my toes, and I can't just block every attack lest I end up hemorrhaging and losing the fight. The issue, as you can see from my footage, are his fucking dogs. He has two of them, and they're about as irritating as you'd expect. They get in the way, and you can barely hit them before another enemy forces you to escape, and they help build up bleed. It's just a lot to handle, very artificial gank territory. So I have to balance the fact that I hate half of this fight, but I really love the other half. So I decided on my winning run to go Giga Brain and equip the Beast Repellent Torch and be done with it. The dogs never moved in on my location, and I was able to kill Eska without much issue in the corner. He drops the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman upon defeat, which grants a 20% attack power buff for 20 seconds when blood loss is procced in the vicinity, 12% for PvP. The perfect talisman if you're running a bleed-based build. I like Eska, I hate his dogs, I want his pyramid head. At number 10, we have the bell-bearing hunter found near the Hermit Merchant Shack in the capital outskirts. The final appearance of Elmer on this series, and it happens to be his least memorable one. It's his second strongest appearance in the game, and yet just like the Deathbird from earlier, he doesn't feel very difficult. If you did your exploring, you've already faced Elmer for real in the Shaded Castle, so taking him on again but with a much larger, wider arena is always gonna feel easier. His moveset will always be a classic, from his Eocade force movements that mean you can never heal safely, to his deadly shield bash and shield slams. Elmer, I'll always love you, baby. He drops the Medicine Peddler's Bell Bearing upon defeat, which grants access to permanent sources of neutralizing, staunching, Thorfrost, and stimulating boluses. And something tells me those stimulating boluses are going to come in handy for the DLC. I'm scripting this video on the 12th of June, but it'll be out after the DLC has launched. So let me know if I was right about that down below. At number 9, we have Sir Gideon Ofnir, the All-Knowing, found in Landell, Ashen Capital. This sneaky little mage has made my life a living hell. Not only is he the most manipulative of the Tarnished, influencing the people of the Round Table Hold like Nefeli Lu, Ensha, and our own player character, but he has the goal to betray us at the end of the game, for no Tarnished can become Elden Lord in his eyes. We must struggle unto eternity. He is one of the most obnoxious mage fights in the series, because depending on the bosses you've defeated, he picks up extra spells he can use. 
Rykard, Moog, and Melania. If you don't defeat them before facing Gideon, he uses a smaller moveset, but if you have defeated them, oh boy, Gideon does not mind breaking out the Blood Boon or the Rancor or the Scarlet Aeonia. I was very lucky that I chose to fight him before Melania because she was kicking my ass. As such, even though his damage output was actually insane, he at least didn't rot nuke me. He doesn't have any cooldowns, so he can consistently be attacking, spamming his Clintstone bullshit. Yet, on a first run, his lengthy speech means you can capitalize and get some early damage, perhaps even ending the fight there and then with the right build. So why is he number 9 if I clearly don't like him? Honestly, his lore, voice acting, and the meme of it all goes a long way. He's a main story fight, I like the concept behind this battle, even if I don't think it's executed remotely well. He killed me more than most bosses too, so I felt obligated to keep him in a single digit placement, and honestly, I'd rather fight him than those beneath, because aside from Eska, all my previous entries were repeat battles. He drops his armor set and the scepter of the all-knowing upon his defeat, which is an extremely underwhelming weapon. It's not even a casting tool, it's a hammer that makes no sense. Elden Ring, come on. The jump from Gideon to our next entry is going to be pretty crazy. And what's that? It happens in the same boss room. Hmm. Ah, Lane Dell, the royal capital, my favorite location in Elden Ring, and a fitting conclusion for this series. If you guys enjoyed this series of me ranking all of the Elden Ring bosses via their region, consider subscribing up there. We're trying to reach 35,000 subscribers by the end of the year, 100,000 subscribers overall on the channel. That is the dream. So, parry that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all my future content. And if you want to go the extra mile and really help out the channel, become a channel member. It is $4.99 a month. It gets you early access to future videos. It gets you a shout out in the description and at the end of each video as well. Wow, that's crazy. Back to our regularly scheduled Lane Dell. At number eight, we have Golden Shade Godfrey fought near the end of Lane Dell Royal Capital. After climbing the roots of the Erd Tree, the last thing I expected was to come across a boss battle with Godfrey, First Elden Lord. But seeing he was a Golden Shade, things made a little bit more sense. An illusion of Morgoth's, who else would he create to protect the throne than his father whom he truly respected? And it makes sense why this shade only takes on the form of Godfrey's Phase 1. Morgoth never saw his father as the warrior of bloodlust Hora Lu. If you like Godfrey's main fight, you'll enjoy the Golden Shade too. It's not as intense because his moves are all scaled back, but having to dodge a jumping axe or hop over a ground stomp can feel very satisfying. He feels like most old school Souls bosses with deliberate axe swings you have to dodge through to do damage and well telegraphed attacks. As someone who actually prefers the first Elden Lord form to the Hora Lu form, Golden Shade Godfrey is perfect for me. A great test to see how far you've come since stepping into Lane Dell, and a way of reminding the player that Godfrey is a character that exists, and we might be seeing him later in the game. Defeating him is also worth it, as you gain a talisman pouch, allowing you to equip an extra talisman to your person. I find it interesting that two of the three talisman pouches in-game are obtained via Morgoth, the first by defeating him as Margit the Fell Omen, this one by defeating his illusion of his dad. Finger Reader Enya gives the third talisman pouch. Diva, are you related to Morgoth by any chance? Just a fun bit of trivia there. At number seven, we have Moog the Omen, found at the end of the subterranean shunning grounds. Similar to our last entry, we have a slight peek in the mid game of one of the end game bosses with Moog's first phase. Lore wise, this illusion of Moog was created to safeguard the path to the Three Fingers and the Frenzied Flame. It's unclear whether this was an illusion created by Moog or by Morgoth, but either interpretation makes sense as neither character wishes for the Frenzied Flame to burn the world. Moog's Phase 1 is actually one of the fairest fights in the entire game. His trident combos are fairly standard and have interesting timings that make them enjoyable to dodge through or block, but it's his blood magic that makes the fight unique. Blood Boon allows him to shower Blood Flame at the player in various formations, and it's up to you to figure out how to dodge each one effectively and counterattack the boss. 
Position is at its most valuable against Moog, as once you know the strategies for countering each move, you can really turn the tides on the Omen. Just be careful of his Blood Flame Talons move, the timing is very tricky and not something I'm the best at dodging. It's also worth noting the Omen has a fairly strong HP pool, so you won't be ending this fight quickly. This further drills the need to learn his moveset, which will eventually come in handy at Mogwin Palace. He drops the aforementioned Blood Flame Talons incantation upon defeat, which allows you to use one of his signature moves, drawing blood from the formless mother to explode in front of your enemies. A satisfying move for close-up melee range, I really should play with the blood incantations more often. Moog the Omen lands just above Godfrey's Golden Shade because even though the two bosses are very similar conceptually, I just prefer Moog. At number 6, we have the Crucible Knight duo found in the Ariza's Hero's Grave. I've gone on length talking about this fight in the past because despite its infamy among the fanbase, I actually really enjoy this gank. The challenge you face is in managing both Crucible Knights so you're not backed into a corner with no opportunities to attack. You have to bait them out. More specifically, the Spear Wielder, as their special attacks often leave them a great distance away from Ordovus, allowing you to get some hits in. There's nothing more satisfying than learning how to kite this pair around the room, dodging a deadly dagger grab before twinblading some damage and repeating the process. It's slow going, but I found with each death and subsequent attempt, I was getting faster, more precise. Or you can go the parry route if you're insane. Once the Spear Wielder goes down, it's just you and Ordovus, who shares the same moveset as the Stormhill Everjail Crucible Knight. Just remember to dodge those tail incantations, and watch out for his special skill, Ordovus's Vortex. He spins his sword to create power before slamming it down as an AoE, and if you're close, you're gonna take some damage. Defeating these bosses gets you the Crucible Axe armor set, as well as Ordovus's Greatsword, which has access to said skill we just mentioned. It's a solid weapon, you can't go wrong with it, and it looks super cool. This gank fight won't be for everyone, in fact I know a few people who absolutely hate it, but that's why this list is subjective, not objective. At number 5, we have the Draconic Tree Sentinel guarding the entrance to Laindell itself. I remember when Elden Ring had gameplay shown ages before it came out, and the Draconic Tree Sentinel was the boss they showed off the co-op system with. It really stuck out to me. All these years later, it's still as memorable as it was back then. The Tree Sentinels are cool, the Draconic Tree Sentinels are a blast. The first half of the fight is a nice way to test the waters, see what's different about this guy, such as the horse being able to shoot fire, that's a novel concept, except when it input reads that you're trying to heal every single time. This is a fight where it's very easy to get greedy and go for extra hits, which will result in a fireball to the face or an axe to the groin. It's when the sentinel powers up mid-fight that things get serious. As the draconic nature of the battle reveals itself, the red lightning of the ancient dragons imbues the boss. Axe slams now create lightning AoEs upon contact. The boss can raise his shield to summon a lightning bolt on your position that you have to learn the timing of to dodge, very nameless king coded. The boss can surround himself with markers that indicate lightning is about to strike, often used as a tactic to get the tarnish to back off so it can then go for a fireball. And finally, it can drag the axe across the ground, creating a giant shockwave, which is followed up by a massive axe slam which will expunge the lightning from his weapon and return him to his phase 1 state. Rinse and repeat until the boss is down. Defeating him gets you the Dragon Great Claw and Dragon Claw Shield, his signature gear, though the weapon isn't anything to write home about. It's meant to do extra damage to dragons, but there are other weapons that outclass it for that exact job. The shield looks super cool though. I really enjoy how formulaic yet intense this boss battle ends up being, and that's why the Draconic Tree Sentinel lands so high on today's list. At number 4, we have Radagon of the Golden Order. Yeah, after a very long period of reflection, I have made a controversial decision. I think I prefer Elden Beast to Radagon now, and I think I've felt this way for a while, but I always said Radagon was better because that was just the popular opinion, I really didn't want to make any waves. 
But if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's that your opinion is going to piss someone off. So fuck it, here we go. Radagon of the Golden Order is one of the most entertaining fights in the game. He's got that iconic main theme OST that got every single person hyped when we encountered him for the first time. His moveset is versatile yet learnable. It doesn't go too far off the deep end with crazy combo strings, and is challenging enough that if you're thrown off your rhythm, you'll struggle to regain your composure. I love the way he's practically dragged by his hammer when he launches towards you, or the way he slams the ground to create holy AoE effects looking very similar to a blacksmith working on a weapon. Fitting, as Radagon wishes to fix the Elden Ring after Madoka shattered it. I'm not the biggest fan of some of his faster moves, like the Holy Spear fan he can fire out relatively quickly, or the various teleporting that makes it hard to keep up, but I think doing well against those attacks just comes with experience that I don't actually have. Aggression is your best friend, as you'll want to get used to taking down Radagon as quickly as possible to bolster your chances against the Elden Beast. And I'm sure some people are wondering, why didn't I rank them together in one entry? It's a valid point, but I've always ranked them both separately in my lists because I feel their fights are so different. And in this case, it wouldn't actually change anything. They'd both be in the same spot on today's video regardless, because... At number three, we have the Elden Beast, the final boss of Elden Ring. I and many others have been through a journey with this creature, because even though the fight is a lot of fun now, that doesn't mean it always was that way. I remember the opening month of Elden Ring and the absolute trauma that was Elden Stars, an attack the beast can use that causes a homing projectile to chase down the player for upwards of 30 seconds, constantly doing damage and making the fight a living hell for anyone involved. Or how about the fact we can't summon Torrent, despite the large arena and the distance the Elden Beast moves after each attack, feeling like it would benefit from Torrent's speed? Yet on my last playthrough, I really enjoyed the Elden Beast. I was expecting pain, hell, stress, irritation, and I got none of that. I found his moves were well telegraphed, from his various golden sword slashes to his homing missiles you run from. I love the golden rings you have to actively jump over, because I swear I constantly forget you can jump in this game. His nebula clouds that cause explosions along their trail is a fun gimmick I hadn't seen since Estelle, and there's something very satisfying about making that distance once you understand the moves Elden Beast is throwing out, so you can deliver the final smackdown. He doesn't run away quite as much as he used to, so if I'm ranking the current state of Elden Beast, he's far and away so much better than he was on release. Thank god for patches, am I right? Elden Stars is still an irritating move to deal with, but at least now it's more like a buzzing mosquito as opposed to a slow-moving machine gun. All of this set to one of the most gorgeous tracks on the OST, so mystical and godlike. A stark contrast to Radagon's bombastic tune, with the backdrop of one of the most stunning arenas in the series too. It's giving Ash Lake lit up like a Christmas tree. I think in this instance, I just prefer the energy that Elden Beast's part of the fight gives over Radagon. I know I'm in the minority there, I'm completely okay with that, and fair play to anyone who prefers Radagon, I genuinely understand. At number two, we have Godfrey, First Elden Lord. If there was a fan favorite fight in Elden Ring for the majority of players, Godfrey takes the cake. From his intimidating introduction as we find him mourning the loss of his child, before he takes the fight to us. The First Elden Lord coming to reclaim his throne. Phase 1 is the same as the Godfrey Shade from earlier in the game, except on top of his usual axe throws and stomps, he can also create big AoEs that cause insane damage. His fissure covers the length of the arena and has to be dodged out of, and he has a large regal roar followed up by a series of massive stomps you have to jump over. Learning his first phase is incredibly satisfying, and for me, it's the part of the fight I enjoy the most. It scratches the same itch I get for fights like Artorius, Gale, Fume Knight, Orphan of Koz. And if that was the whole fight, I think I would enjoy him a lot more. But I have to be honest, Horalu, where he snaps Sorosh's neck and bathes in his blood, just isn't my favorite fight mechanically. 
I love the transition, and I love the concept of us fighting the equivalent of an old JRPG monk, though he's more WWE wrestler at this point. My issue is that Horaloo's attacks are so insanely delayed for the sake of being delayed, they don't feel natural. And when missing some of the delays lead to you getting jankily launched into the air and power bombed, it can get tedious. Love the animation though, it's so fucking stupid. There's also nothing more terrifying than seeing him slam both hands into the ground to lift up the earth, creating devastating shockwaves you have to avoid. Such a spectacle. A really amazing fight. Definitely one of the strongest that Soulsborne has to offer, but admittedly, I really am just not as crazy about him as the rest of the fan base. I wish I was, I really do, but I can't force it. It's fine though, he'll just powerbomb me into the ground for going against him. We cool. At number one, we have Morgoth the Omen King, the Shardbearer of Laindel whom you must defeat to reach the Erd Tree. And how fitting that this is the end of my base game Elden Ring boss ranking series, and I actually am finishing with my favourite boss in the entire game. Morgoth has it all. An interesting backstory that showcases the tragedy of his devotion to the Erd Tree and the lands between, his nature as an omen and yet overcoming that to be the hidden king in the shadows, the way we have personal beef with him as he tried to stop us multiple times as Margit the Fell. He's the only demigod where we have a connection to him prior to his fight, and as such, it feels far more meaningful when he cracks open his staff, revealing his true weapon, Morgoth's Cursed Blade. The battle starts off relatively straightforward. Morgoth attacks you with his sword, as well as his holy weapons that you're used to from the Margit fights. The holy hammer, daggers, spears. He also cartwheels now, which is just fierce for someone of his age. I love how agile he becomes, and his animations are so raw, like how he slides by you using his tail and his power to stop himself. I love the moves where he summons swords from the sky to rain down on the arena. It lasts for a little while and forces you to worry about your positioning so you're not backed into a corner while he continues attacking you. At around half health though, Morgoth's enraged state is triggered, as he begins to vomit up the Omen Curse, coating the arena with water and causing various geysers to appear at random for the rest of the fight. And his shame at his own upbringing, at staining the thrones of the demigods with his curse, it causes him so much pain. And anger, which he unleashes on us. His curved sword is now tinged with blood flame, creating the Cursed Blood Slice skill that got me through a lot of my original playthrough. He's got a Beyblade style spinning attack as the best bosses do, and an insanely cool grab where he spears you on the end of his sword before swinging you off into the distance. I got hit by this one way too many times. This is all on top of his various holy armaments that keep you on your toes, and his overall aggression that makes it much harder to get those hits in. I panic rolled a lot, something I promise to work on in the future because I want to get better at all these games. But at the same time, panic rolling led to some of my closest calls where I just barely beat bosses with no healing left, and Morgoth was a prime example of this. I always connect to boss fights that give me a reason to care about them. Morgoth is a character I cared about. He's someone I had a connection with, a rivalry of sorts, and it's why even if people claim Godfrey is the better fight, I don't know, I think his son is way cooler. Morgoth is my favourite fight in Elden Ring and Dell, so the question remains, will any of the DLC bosses be able to topple him from his throne? And that's my list. Which Dell boss is your favourite and why is it Godfrey? Let me know down below and be sure to parry that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of my future videos. My social medias are on screen now, feel free to follow where you feel comfortable. I recommend my Twitter or my Discord. My Twitter is definitely the best place to go though. Thank you to all of my YouTube channel members for supporting me for another month. You guys are amazing and I'll see you guys next time for another video. Adios.